Hi everybody, welcome to our revision special on monetary policy. This revision webinar is going to focus on several aspects of monetary policy. It's going to have a UK perspective. Obviously you can apply some or many of these ideas and thoughts to other countries as well. And it's a really good idea to have as part of your wider knowledge uh, a little bit of uh, understanding of what's happening, for example, in Japan, what's happening in the European Central Bank, what's happening across the Atlantic in the United States. But our, our main focus in this uh, webinar is going to be on monetary policy and in particular the issue about low interest rates and quantitative easing, to what extent is monetary policy actually helping the British economy to, to grow and rebalance as we head this, hit this really important part of the economic cycle. Let's start off by thinking a little bit about what is monetary policy. According to the Bank of England, monetary policy means stable prices and confidence in the nation's currency. The government uh, has, a, has an inflation target that it, which it sets the Bank of England of 2%, the rate of inflation of consumer prices. So the bank says that stable prices are defined by the government's inflation target, which the, the Bank of England seeks to meet through the decisions, the monthly decisions taken by the nine members of the Monetary Policy Committee. And that uh, committee has been in place since the bank was made independent of government in, Mar in May 1997. This chart shows the rate of inflation in the UK since uh, the turn of the millennium. A CPA, a CPI inflation target of 2%, consumer price index. And you can see that uh, for the first few years, inflation was below target, but within uh, pretty much within 1% of that target. Then it uh, rose above the target, and in particular, in 2008, it was 3.5%. In 2011, it was 4.5%. Uh, so there were several years, in fact, six years, being pardon, nine years, when inflation was above the target. In some cases, uh, quite significantly above the, the sort of 2% target with a 1% margin of fluctuation. The uh, Bank of England in 2011 was being hit by... The economy has always been hit in 2011 by a number of inflationary forces, including um, the weak exchange rate and high oil prices and, and other external factors. Um, interest rates did not change in 2011. They stayed at 0.5%. Now, the last, last few years, you have seen that the rate of inflation in the UK, particularly in 2014, dropped below 2%. And then in 2015, in fact, inflation was barely noticeable. I've got it down as 0.1%. Uh, some figures have it at zero last year. But anyway, 2015 was a year of effectively zero inflation. A fall in inflation, of course, is, is known as disinflation. Uh, the prices are still rising, uh, but at a much slower pace. So monetary policy is, according to the Bank of England, it is price stability. Uh, most of us uh, would define monetary policy as changes in interest rates, the supply of money, the supply of credit, and also exchange rates. And this is a key revision point. A lot of people forget that the exchange rate is an important part of monetary policy. So yes, interest rates is about the rising and falling of market interest rates. It's about uh, the, the, the financial system and the, and the willingness and the ability of banks, for example, and other lenders to, to provide some financial lending to businesses and households. Most of all, about currency markets and the external value of the pound or the dollar. It's about inflation targets. And it's about the roles in particular of central banks in managing monetary policy to meet their objectives. A lot of students write in exams about changes in the interest rate. Um, there is no such thing as the interest rate. There are thousands of interest rates in the economy. And so you need to be careful in an exam, please, to, to, be, to be clear about what you're talking about. Are you talking about the mortgage rate for housing? Are you talking about the policy interest rate set by the Bank of England? Are you talking about savings rates in, in banks and building society accounts? Be really clear in the exam what you're talking about. That's quite important. This chart tracks uh, household savings rates, otherwise known as deposit rates, and lending rates. Uh, loan rates for the UK through to, uh, through to sort of January, March 2016. So it's pretty up to date. And you can see that since 2008, there has been a, a sharp fall, a significant fall in most interest rates. Not all, but most interest rates have come down. In particular, look at the yellow line there. That's the sort of long-term savings deposit rate. That's been stuck below 2% for several years now. 
savers really are not getting a very high rate of return on their money. Uh, mortgage rates have come down. 90% uh, loan to value ratio means that the, the lender is giving you 90, a mortgage 90% of the value of the house. So you have to find a 10% deposit. If you take out a 75% loan to value mortgage, you have to find 25%. The lender pays 75 and hence that's why the loan is cheaper. And the blue line shows the interest rate on a £10,000 unsecured bank loan. That's where you're not putting up any assets like um, whatever, the dog or the house uh, as security on the loan. But the key thing is there are thousands and thousands of interest rates in the economy. There's no such thing as a single interest rate. What we tend to focus on are the big interest rates, the really chunky, important ones. Here are two. The blue line shows the effective mortgage interest rate in the housing market. And again, since 2008, 2009, that's fallen quite a lot, edging down towards 3%. And of course, the orange line is the one that you're probably very familiar with. If you've studied the monetary policy, it's the Bank of England's policy rate or the base rate, which has been stuck at 0.5% since March 2009. What were, we, what were we all doing in that year? Uh, the key point really is that the Bank of England is a central bank. When they, If and when they change the, the base rate, that sends a signal to the rest of the financial market. Um, market sorry. And uh, you would expect interest rates to move in the direction of a base rate change. They don't have to, but nearly always they do. Uh, as we'll see in a few minutes' time, when the Bank of England changes interest rates, other rates will move as well. Uh, I just want to give you this quote from, I think it was Mark Carney in, well, 2015 probably. Uh, and he was, he was talking about whether the base rate of interest would ever go back to the sort of 5% level we saw in 2008. And this is what was quoted, even when the economy has returned to normal capacity and inflation is close to target, the appropriate level of bank interest rates, base rates, is likely to be materially below the 5% level set on average by the MPC prior to the crisis. In other words, we are probably in a new a new era where policy interest rates will stay very low. They might rise from let's say one possibly to two percent, but but unless things change dramatically, we are in an era of very low interest rates. That's important because economies tend to adjust to change in circumstances, and the new normal could well be two or three percent base rate maximum. We make a distinction, as part of your revision, I'm sure you've covered this, between an expansionary monetary policy and a, de a deflationary monetary policy or a contractionary policy. So when you have an expansionary policy, typically base interest rates are falling, both in nominal and real terms. More about that in a second. Uh, Bank of England might be taking measures to increase the supply of credit, encouraging banks to lend out more. And it might also, depending on its exchange rate system, it might also be trying to engineer a depreciation or a fall in the value of the exchange rate. And deflationary monetary policy is the opposite. That's when interest rates on loans are going up, savings rates are rising, the supply of credit is squeezed and controlled more hard or more tightly, and the exchange rate appreciates. Key point from this slide of really the exchange rate is part of monetary policy. And for many countries, it's a mightily important part. Uh, I need to make a distinction between nominal interest rates and real interest rates. I'm sure you've probably covered this. Uh, the real interest rate is often regarded as important for businesses making investment decisions, people making savings decisions, looking for the, for the best real interest rate. And the simple rule is that the real interest rate is the money rate of interest or the nominal rate of interest minus the rate of inflation. So if a saver is getting 6%, but inflation is 3%, but the real interest rate is only 3%. The key is that real interest rates can become negative when the nominal rate of interest is less than inflation. So if inflation is 5%, nominal interest rates are 4%. So 4 minus 5 gives minus 1. And crucially, critically, in a world of deflation, the real interest rate on a debt or the real interest rate on savings can go up because it's nominal minus a minus, which is, of course is a plus. Globally, real interest rates have come down quite a lot. Chart on the left-hand side looks fiendishly complicated, but it's basically the real interest rate on debt issued by advanced country governments. 
and it's fallen from around 8 to 10% in 1990 to around 4% in 2000, now down to around 2%. So real interest rates have come down. That's largely because of a global excess supply of savings, but it's an important feature. Real interest rates have also come down a little bit for emerging countries, but not quite as much, um, partly because interest, nominal interest rates in those countries typically tend to be higher. So the Bank of England meets once a month to decide the base rate of interest. And you're probably thinking to yourselves, well, they've met for the last seven and a half years or so, haven't done a thing. What do they actually talk about? Well, they look at the economic situation facing the economy and they do take into account lots and lots of economic data when deciding whether or not interest rates could change, might change, uh, and in which direction. So they look at anything which they think is relevant to their target. Their target is to keep inflation over the next two years at or around the inflation target of 2%. That is their target. They don't have a target for growth. They don't have a target for jobs. Don't have a target for meeting the Bank of England's governor's bonus. Their, their target is to meet the inflation target. So they look at lots of stuff. They look at GD, how fast the economy is growing. They look at how much spare capacity there is. They look at all the monetary data on bank lending, on mortgage lending, on retail credit in the high street. They look at what's happening to house prices and share prices. They track changes, ups and downs in consumer and business sentiment and confidence. They take a very close look at the labour market, as we'll see in a few minutes. How fast are wages rising? What's happening to costs? Um, what's happening to unemployment and skill shortages and things? And then they look externally as well. They think of what, they think about the exchange rate, although the Bank of England does not have a target for, the, for sterling. Is the pound rising or falling? And what does that mean for inflation? And crucially, they look at the world economy. They look at what's happening in the European Union, single market. They look at GDP growth rates in the big trading partner countries, United States, Germany, Japan, and of course, countries such as China and India. So the Bank of England, when it sets interest rates, is looking at a very large range of factors. Their economists then come together to produce what's called a macroeconomic forecast. The, the thick line here shows the actual growth of the economy up to 2014. And then the bank's job is to produce these, these sort of fan forecasts where the, the further you go out into the future, the, the bigger is the uncertainty, hence the, the widening gap. Uh, notice here, for example, that the, th that the black line comes down. That's the Bank of England forecasting slower growth in 2016 at around 2%. And the darker the blue area is the more likely in their forecast. Once we get down to these outlying here areas, there, there's a possibility of recession, small possibility. There's a possibility of a boom, small possibility. So they look at the growth forecast. And they also produced an inflation forecast. This was this came out last week. This is Bank of England's inflation forecast. So here we go. Follow my cursor. Inflation falling in 2014, 2015. Very, very low inflation. Close to zero. Down here we have deflation. So the bank is forecasting. Follow the thick blood red line there. The Bank of England's forecasting inflation will rise back towards 2%. By the way, they always think that's going to happen. Uh, otherwise, their policy was wrong. Inflation likely to be maybe a tad above the 2% target in 2018. But again, big uncertainty. There could be a little bit of deflation in 2016, 2017, a little bit unlikely, but there could be inflation as high as 4, 4.5%. Now, going forward, see, going forward, even in 2018, there's a range here of over 4%. So nobody is quite sure what the inflation rate is going to be. There is great uncertainty. One of the things they look at, and I really want to focus on this with you in this webinar, is, is, is the link between unemployment and wage growth. So the blue line here shows the rate of unemployment in the UK. And uh, you can see that the unemployment rate is... Sorry, what am I talking about? The, the orange line shows unemployment in the UK. Um, don't even know my own charts. And you can see that since about 2012, the unemployment rate has fallen from 8.4% down now to around 5.1%. So that's quite a big fall in unemployment. I mean, and that's welcome. There's fewer people out of work. Unemployment's now back to the level it was at in 2008. As Mark Carney would say, good news is good news. The fear, the danger is that unemployment falling here could trigger uh, a rise in inflation, perhaps through the labour market. Perhaps it could cause wage 
regular pay to start growing at four or five, six percent, particularly when there are labor shortages. That's why it's called the wage Phillips curve. And if you've covered the Phillips curve in your revision, you'll know it's supposed to show a relationship between unemployment and inflation. Well, at the moment in the UK, unemployment is falling. Yes, wage inflation is picking up, but from a very low level, below 1%. So basically, we've got unemployment of 5% and wage inflation of 2%. Now, the bank looks at this very carefully and has to ask, if unemployment falls further, will this cause inflation? And they're worried about it, clearly. On the other hand, we've seen a fall in unemployment and basically wage inflation stayed low. And who's to say this won't continue? Uh, there's not a great deal of wage bargaining power in the labour market. A lot of people are more concerned about having a job rather than necessarily the pay they're getting. So it could be that unemployment could fall a bit further without their causing inflation. And you notice that the rate of unemployment has kind of flattened out a bit in the last year or so. Is it, has it reached a kind of low level? Is it going to flatline for the next couple of years? We'll see. Another thing to look at is the housing market. Uh, typically central bankers get nervous when house prices are rising very quickly. Um, although they may not necessarily react soon enough to, to bring the party to an end. House prices fell during the recession, as you can see here. But since then, despite a dip in 2011, 2012, there was fears of a double dip there in the, in the economy, house price inflation has been pretty fast. In fact, it's been above 5% since August 2013. Uh, and rising house prices, in theory, of course, stimulate consumer wealth and, uh, and confidence. Another thing they look at is the exchange rate. So uh, here's a, a nice chart showing the link between the exchange rate index and the annual percentage change of import prices, things like imported steel, imported copper, food, rubber, all that kind of stuff, gas, electricity, coal. What you find is that when the exchange rate falls, as it does in 2016, 2015 here, the price of import goes up. And I'm sure you've been taught this when the pound or the exchange rate falls, import prices go up. This chart reinforces that view. And the pound's been falling quite a bit in the last nine months or so, perhaps ahead of a Brexit referendum, and uh, it's causing import prices to, to pick up again, could cause some inflation. So much depends, for the Bank of England, so much depends on the size of the output gap. Uh, the output gap, if you covered it, hopefully you have, is the difference between the level of actual GDP, where the economy is in the cycle, and the level of potential GDP. And in this area here, my cursor, where output is below potential, then we've got a negative output gap, whereas above it, in this area here, we've got a positive output gap and you have some potential inflationary pressure. Now, the output gap in the UK, by most estimates, has started to close. We've had several years of growth now. Nobody's quite sure how much spare capacity there is left in the economy. And if the economy grows at around 2% per year, we could be growing at or around a negative output gap for a little while without there causing some inflation. Here's another way of looking at it. I've, what I've done here is I've just plotted in blue is the actual level of output. Shows a familiar cycle. And, and in green is the estimated level of potential output in the economy. Which, if you've done some revision, which I'm sure you have, potential output is determined by long-run aggregate supply factors. Uh, another thing the bank looks at is oil prices. Okay, So they look at domestic indicators. They look at external indicators. And clearly, in the last couple of years, the big story has been the fall in the price of oil, falling from well over $100 per barrel down to less than 40 at one stage. Those of you who've been right up to date will know that the price of oil is now rising again. I think it's heading up towards 50. Uh, so, that, so some of the impact of falling oil prices will start to reverse and again, possibly bring inflation up later on this year. So what I've done there is take you through some of the data that the Bank of England might look at when setting interest rates. The next bit of our revision is to think about how interest rates affect the economy. This is called the transmission mechanism. So here's a, a quick flow chart. You can always print this off your notes and things later on. If there's a change in market interest rates, for example, the policy rate, uh, let's say, goes up, then that should feed through initially to aggregate demand, um, consumption, savings, investment, exports. 
Eventually, the change in demand feeds through into real variables like output and jobs and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then eventually, um, the changes in the growth of output and employment and wages affect the growth of real GDP and the rate of inflation. So it takes a little while for an interest rate change to feed its way through the economy. And the key, key phrase to use is that there are uncertain time lags between a change in interest rates and a change in inflation. By some estimates, it can take at least a year, possibly two years, for the full effects on growth and inflation to show through after the Bank of England's changed interest rates. Now, when interest rates go down, this is an example of an expansionary monetary policy. The Bank of England or the Central Bank, whoever it is, would be trying to reflate their economy, expand confidence, demand. Uh, maybe the economy's in a slump or there's a risk of deflation. So when interest rates fall, the cost of servicing loans goes down. Um, consumer confidence, in theory, should, should improve if, uh, if people see a fall in interest rates. People with mortgages get more effective disposable income because their monthly mortgage bill is cheaper. Businesses might invest more because of uh, a cheaper cost of borrowing money and perhaps because demand will grow. A, cheap, a cheaper interest rate should be a fillip for the housing market, particularly the mortgage sector. And critically, this one here in orange missed out at the bottom by many students. The exchange rate in theory will fall because lower interest rates will cause an outflow of hot money from the currency markets and, and cause a depreciation. So interest rates designed to be a stimulatory expansion in monetary policy. Um, however, this is a really key evaluation bit. Um, there's been a lot of, lot of work done on why it is that despite seven years of very low interest rates, countries such as Britain, not, not exclusively Britain, but countries like Britain, Japan, some countries in the Eurozone, for example, why is it that they're not growing more quickly? What has changed which reduces the effectiveness, or if you want a technical term, the elasticity of a change in, an interest, in interest rates? just want to offer you a few thoughts on that. Uh, low interest rates can actually be pretty ineffective in stimulating demand and growth when confidence is low. Uh, we use the phrase animal spirit, so people have a low um, feel-good factor about the economy and their own personal situation. Of course, low interest rates also reduces the amount of income for savers who take a hit. Real, in real incomes and real interest could be negative for them. Uh, there could be a very high level of unpaid debt, so people are more concerned with paying off debt than perhaps taking out some extra loans. There could, of course, be deflation, price deflation. And when there is, real interest rates can go up even when nominal interest rates are very low. This is a mightily important point for AS macro students. When there's deflation, even if the nominal rate of interest is low, close to zero perhaps, you can still have a positive real interest rate, which holds back spending. Could be that the currency depreciates, but your major export markets are also in a recession, so you don't get much of a, of a bonus. Monetary policy can become ineffective if fiscal policy is working in the opposite direction. So, for example, fiscal austerity could be in play. And crucially, a lot of people are getting concerned about low interest rates, distorting pensions, so the value of pension annuities has collapsed. People having to work longer into, into retirement, indeed, to, to maintain their living standards. And also, a period of very low interest rates can actually make things worse in the sense that it creates asset bubbles. It drives stock markets and house, housing markets out of, out of um, equilibrium again. And, and you know, if you've been following the housing market, that there's a huge problem of affordability now. Uh, mortgage rates might be low, but, but the problem is getting a mortgage because house prices are so high that people can barely, barely afford to scrape together the deposit. So there are some difficulties, some problems with low interest rates. Keynes talked about this. Keynes talked about the concept of a liquidity trap. And basically, in simple terms, a liquidity trap is when even low, very low interest rates uh, fail to stimulate demand. Um, and the basic idea is that people just don't have the confidence. They basically prefer to hoard cash rather than spend it. And um, when you're in a liquidity trap, it's pretty hard to get out of. In fact, the, the main way is to, is to have a, a highly expansionary fiscal policy, for example, with big infrastructure 
projects. The government, needs, if private sector demand is low and confidence is weak, somebody has to step in and provide that, uh, that extra boost or increment of demand. And it nearly always has to come from the public sector. A most important slide, this one. So when you're talking about interest rates, particularly, by the way, if you're with AQA or NXL, but um, when you're talking about low interest rates, always try to mention the consequences for income distribution. Monetary policy can have quite a serious effect on, on the, the gap between rich and poor. So, for example, when there's a, a big fall in interest rates, as we've seen, savers lose out, particularly if the rate of interest on savings is less than inflation. They can lose out big time. Whereas people with a mortgage gain a huge amount. So there's a redistribution away from people with savings towards people with variable interest rate debt. And uh, crucially, also people with um, unsecured debts and things. Uh, if, if, interest, if, if interest rates go down on those, lo those loans, they're better off, which could be a good thing, particularly if you're on a, on a low income. But the key really is that savers lose out when interest rates are falling. A word or two about QE. Uh, we have a separate topic video on quantitative easing, and I'm sure you've probably revised it. I just want to briefly go through it with you as part of our webinar. So QE in the UK came in in nine, 2009. Um, you know, when central banks around the world have been cutting interest rates and conventional monetary policy was kind of reaching the floor, if you like. They were running out of bullets to fire. They decided to bring back in quantitative easing. The main aim of QE is to increase demand and avoid the risk of a deflationary depression, where GDP falls by more than 10%. I'll go through this with you, actually, but the, uh, I'll go through a little flowchart which takes you through this. But the key point is this. QE is not printing new notes and coins. The bank loan does not print them. It creates the money electronically. And it's now worth £375 billion in the UK. Now, let's go through how QE works. If you've got your vision notes to hand, this could be quite useful. So how does QE actually work? The central bank creates new money by adding money to their balance sheet. If only I could do that to my own balance sheet. The central bank then uses that money to buy financial assets, which at the moment is mainly buying existing government bonds. Those bonds initially have been bought by the banks. Two things happen. If the central bank buys those bonds, the demand for bonds in the market goes up. That drives up the price of bonds and a higher price of a bond if the interest is fixed means that the yield or the interest rate on a bond goes down. So quantitative easing is designed basically to drive the price of bonds up to bring down the interest rate on bonds. And that should make mortgages a little cheaper and it should make it a little cheaper for businesses to borrow long term and hopefully stimulate investment. The second effect of QE, of course, is to inject some liquidity into the banking system so that banks have more money to play with and hopefully lend out to deserving businesses and consumers and grow demand there. What's not mentioned on this slide is also that QE works through the exchange rate. If interest rates fall as a result of QE, then the exchange rate should also depreciate. So QE is basically about trying to increase the base supply of money in the economy give the banking system more liquidity to work with and bring down the cost of borrowing. We have a separate video, by the way, on QE. So I, haven't, I won't go through the costs and benefits of QE with you this time, if you don't mind. Uh, just go to our YouTube channel and just type in QE and there's a nice little five, 10 minute video on QE you can look at. Bank of England basically faces many challenges. It's not an easy job being a central banker, uh, believe me. Um, so their, their key aim is to maintain price stability. So they want to avoid deflation, uh, and, but they, they want to avoid you know, inflation of 4, 5, 6%. That's their key challenge. The second challenge, of course, is to try and help the recovery in the economy. We had a very painful shock in 2008. Some people think it will take us a generation to recover from that if we do. And one of the bank's aims is to return to more normality, um, whatever the new normal is. Third aim is to help, not explicitly, but to help the economy rebalance rebalance away from kind of debt fueled consumption more towards helping exporters and helping businesses to invest and crucially 
Um, the bank has a key role in terms of maintaining financial stability. Indeed, it now has a financial policy committee designed to do that. And I'll say something about that in a separate video. Well, how's the Bank of England's policy worked in recent years? You know, there are lots of people who've criticised the bank. If you go onto Twitter, there are plenty of Bank of England critics piping away. Other people think the Bank of England's done a pretty decent job in the last five, ten years. I think the case for the Bank of England is that they moved very quickly in 2008. They cut interest rates from 5.5% to 0.5 and they've kept them there ever since. You know, the bank moved swiftly to avoid the big risk at the time of deflation and the depression. And you could argue that they moved quicker than the European Central Bank. And that's the case for staying outside the euro. We've got a more competitive currency and lots of businesses in the UK have benefited from that. And the Bank of England also hasn't raised interest rates too quickly. They've kept interest rates at 0.5%, particularly during the euro crisis, which really kicked in from about 2010. 2011 onwards. However, there are plenty of critics of the bank prepared to have a pot shot at Mark Carney and, and his predecessor, Irving King. Uh, they criticised the bank for having allowed inflation to rise above target in 2008, 2012. Although, as we've seen, that was fairly temporary. They think the bank has allowed interest rates to be too low for too long, and, that, and that's causing a housing boom, which will be unsustainable. Um, they argue that low interest rates have been less effective. Um, the, the bank should have really been trying to alternative things but much more quickly and they also point to the fact that Britain has the, the highest current account deficit for at least two generations we're importing far more than we're exporting and uh, that could be that could be the result of interest rates being being too low well the key really I suppose the key decision is whether interest rates should rise uh, well if and when they should rise I mean they've been at 0.5 percent since 2009 are we are we set fair for another year of 0.5% will interest rates rise this year if you're taking A levels next year will they have risen by the time you take your final year papers in 2013 Mark Carney the new governor brought in something called forward guidance this uh, was quite unusual at the time he said basically said that interest rates would not start to rise as long as unemployment stayed above 7% and it's basically trying to build some confidence into the system saying look we're not going to do a knee-jerk reaction interest rates will gradually start to change once the labour market is kind of under under control and more people in work. And then unemployment rose, fell to a well below 7% and interest rates didn't budge and so and there was no sign of wage inflation. So the bank had to quite quickly readjust forward guidance and it's now changed. So forward guidance is technically still in place but the bank looks at a range of measures of spare capacity, including unemployment, not just that. They look at other measures. What might happen if they raise interest rates? Well, if they raise them, they'll raise them slowly. So they might base, base, raise, base interest rates. That would be a, a signal of a tightening of monetary policy. Eventually, market rates would start to rise. You'd start to see borrowing costs go up a little bit. Mortgages would become a little bit more expensive. That might cool the housing market might bring down the growth of retail credits, might cause the currency to appreciate. But interest rates in the UK, if and when they go up, they will go up slowly because the Bank of England doesn't want to shock the economy into a sudden slowdown. And in fact, if you can argue that if you, if you gently nudge interest, interest rates up slowly, you're actually helping confidence because people think, yeah, this is okay, 0.5%, 0.25% is fine. It means the economy is strong enough for this to happen. Final slide. Uh, you know, when you're evaluating monetary policy, it's always good to mention in time lags. Uh, most students seem to, but time lags can vary. Never quite sure what the time lags are. I think crucial point is that monetary policy is not an exact science. Maybe you've done a bit of behavioural economics, but consumers and businesses rarely, rarely behave in a way that textbooks predict they will. And why should they? They don't live in an economics textbook. And many things affect inflation. It's not just the interest rates set by the Bank of England. So take a look on our YouTube channel for a really, really good little video clip on internal and external causes of inflation. The Bank of England, you can argue, doesn't actually control inflation at all. It just basically controls the underlying growth of the economy. The penultimate point is critical, that, but monetary policy does not work in isolation. What's happening to fiscal policy can have a significant effect 
on, on jobs, on GDP, on inflationary pressure. And it can also affect uh, monetary policy. And also the objectives can change. There's some debate at the moment about whether the Bank of England's inflation target should be altered. Um, the Federal Reserve has a, a mandate which is maximum employment, stable prices, moderate long-term interest rates. So the Fed has a dual mandate for jobs in prices, whereas of course the Bank of England only has a mandate to keep inflation at 2%. So although um, interest rates have stayed exactly where they were for seven years or more, there's actually still quite a lot happening with monetary policy. And hopefully over the last half an hour or so you found something useful in terms of giving you that overview, that sense of the data the bank uses and some of the key factors that are used when, when the bank sets rates. There'll be lots of shorter videos on monetary policy uh, on our YouTube channel. Good luck with your macro papers and uh, thank you very much for joining in this particular webinar. Thank you.